Welcome to the Invisible India podcast. I'm Jessica. And I'm Abhishek. We are a cross-cultural couple doing life in India, exploring the lesser-known mysteries of Indian culture, interviewing fascinating figures who have chartered new territories, and sharing life as we raise our multicultural family amongst the complexities of modern Indian life. I have with me today Leslie Werner. She is the author of Invited Hospitality in an Age of Loneliness. I am so excited to have you on today, Leslie. I'm mm, so excited to be here. So this book is so much more than I expected. And I already had pretty high expectations <laughs> because I know your life and I know your writing ability. I'm a bit of a tough person to make cry, and you had me in tears at one point. Oh, gosh. (laughs) (laughs) Just talking about, like your title said, the loneliness in Western culture and how much you've learned from other cultures, particularly East Asian, Middle Eastern, and South Asian cultures. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we're going to get into that a little bit. want to learn a little bit about you, but to give a little introduction that you know, Leslie and I are friends and have been friends for, I don't know, how many years, I guess? Wow, we met. Like 10. Yes. One thing I appreciate about you and many reasons I wanted to have you on this podcast is that you are a woman on a journey. And even though you're so learned, you approach the topic of cross-cultural hospitality with such humility and just a posture of learning and discovery. And I just really so wanted to share your research and your learnings and your perspective with other people. Before we talk about your book and how you got into researching cross-cultural hospitality, let's talk about you a little bit. So you've lived in China, Chicago, where we met, and you're currently in Colorado. So Mm -hmm. you share a little bit about your journey. Sure. We have been in Colorado for about four years now. We moved here from Chicago when we had two kids. Right now, our kids are, they just turned three, five, and seven years old. Before I lived in Chicago, I studied cult, but I lived in China for five years. I um, I got my master's in intercultural studies, and that kind of started me learning more about other cultures and delving into some of the differences between my culture, which I didn't even realize I had a culture until I lived overseas. I was like, oh, there are specific ways I do things. And then I studied Chinese full-time for two years, ended up back in the States getting married to an actor um, who does audiobooks. So yeah, so life has been very different than I expected. Um, and, and I've also been a teacher. So in Chicago, I before I had kids, I was teaching middle school and the public schools before and after China. And I also taught in China. I taught English. So we've had a lot of transition in our lives. You know, I experienced what it was like to be a stranger in a new place in China, experienced so much hospitality there from friends. And so a lot of those transitions are what got me thinking more about Mm. hospitality and the ways that we show hospitality in the West or we don't show hospitality in the West. And kind of got me asking like the question of what would it look like if we did practice hospitality in some of the ways that my friends in China did. So I spent six months in Uganda also. So I've had a little bit of exposure to that culture. So a lot of questions and a lot of just trying to learn from other cultures, how Mm -hmm. to do relationships in a different way, maybe. One of the things that's really drawn me to your writing is the honesty in which you approach being a white American, learning Mm -hmm. about other cultures And just the posture that you take, I feel that just the way that you are open about your journey, about your learning process, I think that a lot of people can really relate to that. And there's so much like polarity in our our political discourse and in our Mm -hmm. cultural discourse about what it means to be a white person engaging in other cultures. And I feel like you just bridge Mm -hmm. this really honest and open way. And I really just love that about your writing. So you've had a blog for many years. What are some of the topics that you kind of led you to where you're at now or your through your blogging journey? Yeah. 
So I started blogging. I thought about starting a blog when I was in China, but I just I wasn't ready. It wasn't time. Mm. And so when I came back uh, from China, especially when I became a mother is when I actually started my blog. I just had this kind of itch to write something and put it out there, except I didn't tell anybody that I had. I, like, in fact, I didn't even use my name at first. So my husband knew it existed. I wrote like four blog posts and then I just kind of let it go until we moved to Colorado. I saw this challenge to bloggers that you could write every day for the month of October. It was called Write 31 Days. And you pick a theme or a topic and you write about that thing like for the whole 31 days. Immediately, I knew that I wanted to write about what it was like to move from China back to the United States. So Mm -hmm which a lot of expats call re-entry. So I'm like, I need to write about this experience because it was so disorienting to really adapt to a certain culture and then move away from that culture and try to readapt to my own culture, which felt so foreign. And Mm. so I didn't really know how I felt or what I thought. and, And so I was like, I just need to write this out. And so that's when I started my blog back up again. I did, um, by the end of the 31 days, I felt so much better. It was like I was feeling sick and I felt healed suddenly just from the process of writing it all out, figuring out what I was feeling. So that would kind of got me started writing about cross-cultural issues and differences that I saw in my culture uh, versus especially, you know, Chinese culture. And just it, it kind of got me thinking too of like, well, what do I want to, what do I want to keep? Mm. There were some things I didn't like about Chinese culture, just like there's things I don't like about my own culture. And so as I started in making a new life here in the United States, I was like, well, what can I keep from that culture that I loved so much? Is it even possible? I kind of write whatever I want to write. I'm not like, I don't have like a brand really. Now that I've experienced what it's like to live in another culture, I, I can see the ways that, that, that our Western culture, uh, we think that this is the way things should be. Um, but in fact, it's just the way our culture is dictating it. And so I feel like it's given me a, a different perspective than I had before. I think one of the things that I really connected with with your writing was the journey of re-entering back to the U.S. as you had come back from China and I had come back from India and, and now I've done that back. again. <laughs> I've gone right? back. Yeah. And we met at that stake in our life where we had both kind of been through a similar transition. Some of the things that you've continued to write about are things that I'm passionate about as far as gender equality and especially uh, racial justice. And that's something that I'm really excited to hear just more from you about and the way that you elevate other excellent writers Mm -hmm. and thought leaders in this area. I think that we need a lot more voices. Um, Even we need white voices to continue to be a part of the conversation and and uplift and stand beside our brothers and sisters and friends and colleagues who are people of color and who are in various walks of life. And so that's something I've really appreciated about you that I just wanted to throw that out there before we dive into the the book, because that's something I think that people need to understand about you. Mm -hmm. You're not just like this random white lady that thinks that you're an expert on something. Like I really, (laughs) we have enough of those in the world, right? Yeah, no. Very yeah, much. I'm like, okay, I, there's so much I don't understand. Yeah. How can I figure it out? Uh, maybe I can bring some other yes. people that are on the similar stage of the journey with me and yeah. in my exploration of what I don't know. <laughs> basically. Exactly. And that's one yeah. of the just strongest points of, of, I think, your story and the way that you navigate through this topic. So uh, let's get into it a little bit. Two of the main points that I gained from being invited mm-hmm. is that Western culture has a lot to learn from other cultures. And the second is that divinity is sprinkled throughout humanity. Mm. And we can find that in people from all over the world and we can connect and share with each other. So Mm -hmm. those are two of the main learnings that I had. And so what, what was the initial thrust of invited as you're writing what's the thesis of the book so the thesis i would say is that we in the west can definitely benefit from studying how other cultures practice hospitality and also 
elevate relationships above busyness and especially value relationships over our tasks. It doesn't mean that I didn't see people in China being busy because people were certainly very busy. There were plenty of work- workaholics. And so I saw that too. But it just seems like organically, people are more willing to make space for a relationship in a way that often we're not in the West. And so I just kind of wanted to explore like what, what that would look like in our daily lives if we in the West practice some of those ways of showing hospitality that I've seen in other cultures. Um, and especially when it comes to valuing people over tasks yeah. and um, just making space for not just people, you know, that you meet for coffee, but like also having people in your home, just showing other people around you that, that mm-hmm. they're important and that you have time for them. I think a lot of other cultures just do that so naturally. I think it's kind of like me who I didn't even realize I had a culture until I left it. I think, you know, my Chinese friends might not have called themselves hospitable, but Mm -hmm. they were. I mean, it was just, it came so naturally. And so um, I just wanted to learn from these cultures, like what I could do in my own culture to kind of reflect a bit of that yeah Um, and one of the things I love about your story and what you share in the book is the upon returning to the U.S. you kind of thrust yourself into uh, an international community or you kind of made your own international community when there was hardly any international community you really threw yourself into relationships with people from other cultures even while you're in the U.S. And Mm -hmm. trying to connect with maybe people that were lonely or people that were totally on their own who had come from a different place just because you kind of, you knew where that feeling of being an outsider alone. And so you incorporated a lot of those stories and invited. So I want to read a portion of your book that I could really relate with on page 15. Hospitality for our family usually looks like this. I wait until the last minute to tell my children we're having guests because they morph into crazed creatures, pulsating with energy the second they know more attention-giving bodies will be in our home. When my pre-arrival stress threatens to erupt, I turn on a movie for the kids as I sweep crumbs and issue marching orders to my husband turned servant. (laughs) (laughs) Seconds before our guests arrive, we scan the house, noting the value of having guests, even if it's just to have a decluttered home. But then reality check arrives. The doorbell rings and my two boys hide while my daughter rushes to the door. Suddenly, all of disheveled hair and stained clothing and drags any kid guests to her and her brother's messy bedroom. The guests make their way into the kitchen and plant themselves at the kitchen island. My husband, Adam, delivers drinks while I try not to screw up the whole meal in minutes because now I'm not only stressed and hungry, but distracted. The kids dash to the house, dumping dolls from baskets and crashing trucks over our feet. They reach grimy hands over the counter to blindly grab at olives, cheese, or chips. I calmly and slowly remind my children of what we talked about before our guests arrive. They should play outside or in designated rooms. Go there right now, please. They ignore me. I stand there, fingers covered in garlic, knife in hand, and keep smiling at my newly arrived guests. Welcome to our happy home. (laughs) (laughs) I can so relate to this and... Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of the issues that we have in the West are because we have these unrealistic Mm -hmm. standards that we want people to think that our lives are perfect. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. (laughs) It was very refreshing to hear that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I wanted to start with that so that people didn't think that hospitality was all beautiful and perfect at my house. (laughs) Crystal glasses and... (laughs) Yeah, no. (laughs) I wrote that right after we'd had someone over. And so it was very, it was very fresh in my fresh. mind. <laughs> so one of the other quotes from your book I want to pull out here is about one third of U.S. adults age 45 and older re- report feeling lonely. This is really a startling statistic. And how do you think we, we got here? Do you think it's because we have we want people to think that we're okay. Do you think we just have so many walls? Like how did, how did we get here? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it is, is cultural, you know, I think so much of the West really values privacy and independence and, um, 
you know, we're very individualistic. And there's some, I mean, there's some advantages to that for sure. But overall, I think we end up, the more privacy we get, and I have another quote from um, a book called The Pursuit of Loneliness. Mm. But, you know, the more privacy that we we get, it's almost like the more the more lonely we feel. So mm-hmm. it's like we, we keep wanting to be isolated, but then we're alone and we, we don't want to be alone anymore because there's so many, not just emotional benefits or social benefits to relationships, but like health benefits. And that was one thing I thought was really interesting. There was a book I found called uh, The Village Effect. Susan Pinker is the author. She said that she now schedules time with people into her day just the way she schedules exercise because mm-hmm. of all the health benefits to being with other people because studies have shown that people who don't feel lonely and who are in a community actually live longer than yeah. people who are isolated and you know there's a lot of especially adults in the US you know as we get older and maybe you know our kids go to college and leave usually we live different places from our families right. and then if a spouse dies like often there's these adults living all by themselves i think that's even before people go into a home where they're that it at least has a little bit of community but i think there's a lot of adults living just all by themselves but mm-hmm. um yeah so i think a lot of it's cultural so i mean there's these advantages and we want a private house and we want you know, our own everything. But then the downsides of that is that we are lonely and we're isolated and we're, we take ourselves out of community. And you see that happening more and more in society. I mean, even recently here, I've been so annoyed because the fast food restaurant like Taco Bell, you can't order at the counter with a person anymore. There's like a screen. So (laughs) you have to go and like push all these buttons. And I'm like, I came inside because I want to tell someone my order and my three children are running around. I'm like, I don't want to stand here at the screen touching buttons when there's people behind the counter that I could just talk to face to face. (laughs) So this is my my latest uh, rant. But but that's an example of the fact that each move that we make in society to be more independent, basically, it takes us out of relationships Mm. with even just people face to face you know, that we're buying things from in the West for the sake of convenience. Mm -hmm. Anyway, (laughs) you you see so many signs of it all around the West. Yes. And one thing that I've observed living in India is that people idealize that kind of lifestyle because Mm -hmm. they don't, they're not, they're not aware of the ugly side that we've just talked about. So I and we, we're on the bit of an extreme here, I would say probably India and then in South Asia in general, and mm-hmm. then maybe parts of the Middle East, that you literally, the only private time you have is when you're in the bathroom. I kid mm-hmm. you not. Yeah, literally, no, I believe every, it. Literally every space of your life, the road, the home, mm-hmm. your classroom, your office, it's filled with other people. You yeah. cannot be alone. You have no margin to be alone. So... Part of that's because of population and part of that's just the culture that people are yeah. constantly together and in relationship. And sometimes people say here that it's too much relationship. It's too much interference. Right. Of, 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 of I know. So we but need there the is balance this, of both. Right. right. Yeah. There is a balance that I think needs to be there. And um, we don't need to idealize, I think, you know, either place because yeah. somewhere in the, in the middle where we're connected with others that not interfering in each other's lives but we have privacy but we're not completely isolated there's there is a happy medium somewhere or some place for each and every person but I feel like your book does a great job of reaching across those spaces and finding places where we can learn from other cultures like India like Saudi Arabia like Iran and 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 without yeah without you said like idealizing and being like it's so perfect over right there. And this exactly. is so imperfect. Yeah. Exactly. No, I have a section in my book. I forget which chapter it is, but talking to my Chinese friend and I was complaining about my Western culture and she was mm-hmm. like, there's so many great things about it. Like here's, you know, all these ways that this is a benefit. And I was like, oh, okay. I guess there's some, <laughs> I mean, obviously there's a lot of wonderful things about it. And um, I think it's just good to be aware of the ways that our culture steers us to be a certain way. Lately, our, I've noticed that Western culture often steers us to be isolated for the, you know, for the sake of convenience. And I think 
in the end, you know, we need a balance. We need both. Mm -hmm. One of the quotes I really loved from Invited, hospitality is a lifetime of recurring invitations. Mm -hmm. And this is to bring it into Indian culture a little bit. We have many sayings in Mm -hmm. Hindi, which are, you know, you know, please, you know, keep coming. Kabibiana, you know, come anytime. Mm. It's the same thing, you know, please just keep coming and continually come. Like, and people really mean it too. I mean, it's right. It's not that, you know, you can tell the difference between someone's fake, oh, you know, come over, and then right. the real, you know, please come. And you, mm. you can tell the difference once you're kind of enculturated with the nuances a bit. But one of the things that you included in your book is the very famous Sanskrit mm-hmm. saying is guest is God. Mm-hmm. Atithi Devo Bhava. This is changing in India as people are kind of tumbling towards individualism. And what this is basically saying is, you know, guest is God. Anything that mm-hmm. a guest wants, you make it happen. And you you kind of circle your life around the guest. So it means, you know, there's a high priority of having guests. And I think this is one of the most beautiful things about Indian life and Indian culture is that real desire and joy that people have from having guests over. It's almost like even if you're really bothering somebody, a lot of times they won't say anything. They'll drop whatever they're doing yeah. to, to uh, accommodate you. And are you busy? No, 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 I'm not busy. I'm not busy. Mm-hmm. But you have to dig a little bit to see that they're actually busy so one of the right. things I, you know I was so guilty for when I was new is was I would sit for hours and just drink tea with people but they were really had other things they needed they really had other things they needed. <laughs> but they would they would be oh no just sit a little longer sit a little longer and I'm thinking okay sure you know they, I don't want to be rude but really they they were just saying that because mm-hmm. you know it's 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 rude to you know push a guest out of your door right so right. Yes, so, it was the same way. <laughs> yes, and I loved, when you've had many um, international students that lived with you from a range of a couple of months to, I don't know, a few years? We're actually on our third, okay. um, and she's been with us for over a year, Okay. and then she's from Ghana, and then uh-huh. we had a woman live with us from India, actually, f- yes. for six months. Yes. And then we ha- we had a girl from, or also a woman, from Saudi Arabia for almost a year. But we we had her, like we we got to know her really well because she was mm. in the states for maybe right. four years. But she was studying at some different places. Yeah, so we've had um, yeah guests live with us, which has mm-hmm. is a totally different yes. feel than just inviting someone. You know, like no matter what, even if they were American living with us, it's it's really different. Definitely. So, mm-hmm. One of the story. One of the stories I want to share from your book is mm-hmm. with your your daughter and your Indian house guest that you had with you, mm-hmm. and it, you shared a story about how your your guest would do her prayers and have her puja in the morning, and mm-hmm. that your daughter would would sit with her and like, learn how to do Om. You know, mm-hmm. and that's just one of my favorite moments about <laughs> you. Um, first of all, that. You know, it's so typical because Indian people love to share culture Mm -hmm. and and Mm -hmm. invite other people to experience Indian culture. Very open, which I think is why, like, yoga has become so popular and and a lot of, like, kirtan and and different uh, expressions of Indian spirituality become so popular because Indian people are really open with other people adopting Mm. That's a good point. Um, mm-hmm. And so I would love to hear just some of your other experiences if you could share with having your Indian guests, some of the things that you learned and your some of the things your family learned from having her. I feel like the the most memories I have are when her parents came over because mm. um, she was very busy. She was a graduate student, and um, but we, we did see her occasionally, but especially when her parents came, it was their first time even going on an airplane. And they came oh, wow. and stayed for, um, well, it, they stayed here for a month, but we were out of town for two weeks of it. Mm-hmm. So we um, got to know them for about two weeks. And they had us call them Baba and Ai. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, and they... They're from Maharashtra, from uh, Mumbai? 
Yeah, that area. Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So anyway, it, it was it was fun to like have my kids get to know them, and they brought us books about what was Burble and Akbar, um, okay. <laughs> and so they brought all these books. <laughs> and um, but we ate at different times though, so that was hard because. <laughs> Yes. You know, like, so we, my kids wake up at six in the morning and they yes. eat breakfast at seven in the morning right. and then they go to school at eight thirty, and then, um, you know, we eat lunch at about noon and then dinner at about five thirty PM. And yes. so I'm sure you know all this, but, yes. um, I ate yeah. breakfast at like nine thirty, <laughs> and then lunch at two yeah. and then dinner, like they were yeah. eating dinner as we were going to sleep at uh, night. Yeah. Like my husband and I were in bed at nine o'clock and they were eating dinner. Yeah. <laughs> so so yeah. it was challenging at first because I was like, how are we ever going to spend time with them? Because our meals are all different times. But, you know, I have little kids, so it was hard to just change our schedule quickly. And they they had never been here. So it was, you know, they weren't really ready to change their schedule either. Right. So um, I think one of the things you can hold on to are your food habits and your food timing when everything is so different. At least true. Food control yeah. of your house is something. Yeah. True. Continue. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, so that was, that was hard cause I wanted to spend time with them. And so like the second week they were here, finally, I was like, you know what? I just need to invite them into our life. I invited them and I talk about this in the book to a little hiking place. And so they came with us and their daughter was in school. So that was the other thing too. She didn't tell us they were coming, but she was going to be busy every day. <laughs> so and they oh. didn't have a car. So like her parents were just here. And so, um, so finally, you know, we invited them to go with us and, you know, it was so wonderful. Like we sat by a river and they told us, you know, he told us about his childhood growing up swimming in the river and, you know, he kind of did everything that my children did, you know, like kind of helped my son climb a tree and then Aww. threw rocks with my other son and then took off his shoes and socks and walked in the water with my daughter and, Anyway, it was just a good reminder that a lot of times hospitality is just inviting people into what you're already doing. Um, And especially cross-culturally, I think that that helps a lot to just, especially if you can't get times to line up or food, you know, like my kids couldn't eat any spicy food. And so they're just not used to it, which is so sad because I love spicy food so much. (laughs) (laughs) I need to start training them. But um but, you know, for me, that was a reminder, like any cultural situation, like to just invite someone along into what your family or what you are already doing. And it's usually wonderful for someone else to experience the novelty of a new experience. So that it was fun. And we did they did cook us a meal. I mean, and that's been my experience. People will come and stay with me and then they'll cook me a meal in my own home. Um, you know, <laughs> yes, nice. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, but that, that happened even in China. I would invite my students over. Well, because most of them didn't like the food that I would cook. So I was like, they'll right. be more comfortable if they come to my house and cook what they like. And I loved, I loved Chinese food. And so they would teach me how to cook something. And then, you know, I would buy the ingredients and we would eat it together. That was a great way for me to like kind of bridge that, I don't know, the tension of food. Cause it's like, yeah, what if, sure. what if people don't like what I cook or, and I was more used to kind of trying a whole variety of foods. So I, it was easier for me to adapt, I think. Sure. So. You crossed a lot of bridges in friendship with people, which is really sweet. <laughs> and I love a lot of your stories in the book. Something that you, you said just reminds me of one of your, uh, a quote that I want to pull out here is uh, on hospitality. You do it because life together means not hiding behind closed doors, but inviting people into your actual life. Mm. And I just love that. There was another story about um, you inviting a bunch of Saudi Arabian women over to mm. carve pumpkins Mm-hmm. in your home and it was just this is the one that made me cry because most of these had never been invited to an American's home mm-hmm. uh, it just was really touching to see that how um, a, such a small gesture could bring so much joy to someone that had maybe been there for a long time and no one had reached out to them mm-hmm. in any way just to even have a conversation or mm-hmm open a door to form a friendship so yeah. that's really um one of my favorite points of the book mm-hmm. yeah well and I think having Still been 
a stranger yourself in another mm-hmm. culture, you've seen that value of being invited in. I think along with that story, I said something. There was a, a time I visited a student in her home. I was just thanking them so much for their hospitality. And her dad mm-hmm. said to me, well, if I went to your country, I know you would do the same for me. Mm-hmm. And I was, you know, I think, I, I mean, I would because I've experienced that, but right. the average American Wouldn't. maybe would not because no. most of us have not been a stranger in that way, like in another exactly. culture where you can't even read a sign, where right. you, ha- you don't know where to buy a tomato. Like, I mean, it's, and so I think it gives you an empathy for others and for, for people visiting your own country when you have been a stranger yourself in another place. So I, I think the people that are doing the inviting here are usually people who have been somewhere else and they know what it's like to mm. not know anything about <laughs> about your I mean not, not that you don't know anything but you don't you don't know how to live your basic daily life right. and the struggle of that especially at the beginning so we've identified you know a lot of the ways that western culture really struggles with with loneliness and how do we kind of put people as a priority. So do you have any kind of practical tips of things that we can learn from other cultures? How can we bring some of these values into our Western culture? Yeah. I mean, I think for me, I've been most challenged to not be so busy and Mm -hmm. um, to prioritize people. Actually, lately, I don't talk about this in the book, but lately I've been thinking about my time in terms of like Like I'm holding a a deck of cards, like not the whole deck, but like my hand if I'm playing a card game. And if I pick up a card, then I have to, usually in most games, you have to put down a card. You have to discard Mm -hmm. a card. And so that's my time. And so if I pick up maybe like piano lessons for my son or an activity, I have to put down a card. And usually the card that I put down is free time to be hospitable or energy to be hospitable. Recently, my daughter wanted to take ballet lessons. So, you know, we picked up that card. And then what I realized the card we put down was usually we we spend that time uh, with neighbors. Like that's when my, st- mm-hmm. my kids would mm-hmm. go down the street and talk and I would talk to the parents and they would talk to the kids. And I'm like, oh, well, we don't have that time anymore because we're doing this activity. So I think it's just realizing we all have limited time like how do we want to spend that time do we want to spend it working more or getting our kids to be the best at something that they probably won't ever do as adults you know Um, or do we want to have extra time in our schedule for people and for relationships and for things that have a lot longer lasting effect um, and influence on our lives and on the lives of our families so Mm -hmm. I think every culture actually is struggling with that I mean it, it seems like just reading the headlines around the world. It, mm. It's not like people are all sitting around drinking tea all the time every day. I mean, everyone has to work. Um, right. But I think it's just kind of evaluating how we how we choose to spend our time and if we're actually choosing people. Are there things in our, in our schedules we can let go of that leave us room to still be hospitable and invite people over without feeling so stressed because it's, it's just another thing to do. So right. I think that's one of the most beautiful points of your book is that hospitality isn't just another thing, right? It is a mm-hmm. lifestyle that you're trying to uh, encourage people to reconsider. And you yourself, yourself have been through this and mm-hmm. you know, you've been molded by interacting with people from other cultures, but not everyone has, has been that brave or has had those opportunities to do that. And so I really appreciate your voice in this and, your book, Invited, came out? August 13th, 2019. August, August 13th. Okay, mm-hmm. great. And the book is written from a Christian perspective, and you call out people who identify as Christians to see how their faith can actually be more authentically experienced through mm-hmm. hospitality. Um, but as I was reading it, I really felt like this book is relevant for anyone mm-hmm. who's thinking that there might be something wrong with the way that we are doing life in the West. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One of the, the publishers weekly reviewed my book and said that they felt like it was for anyone. Yeah. I definitely feel the same way, which is why I wanted to highlight you on my podcast. So yeah, I was so why I wanted to highlight you on our podcast. So 
So where can people find your book and where can they learn more about you? Yeah. My blog is called Scraping Raisins. It's like you're scraping raisins out of the bottom of the box. <laughs> That's okay. the, the title, <laughs> scrapingraisins.com. My, all my social media links are on there and I have a contact form. And if they sign up for my newsletter, I'll send them chapter one of my book for free. Yeah, my book is, you know, on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, mm-hmm. anywhere, you know, online. Or if they're in the States, they can order it from their independent bookstore. It's a, it's around, so it, it's pretty easy to find. Yes. Well, I hope that many people will pick up Invited and learn more about what you do. You, you write about such important topics. You write about so many, so many things that are close to my heart. So I'm passionate to get the message out there. Just really, I think that you have a unique voice and I just really appreciate you being on the podcast and talking with us. Really thankful for who you are and and what you're doing and your vision, time that you take to express that vision really sensitively and lovingly. Mm. Well, thank you. (laughs) Yeah, it's fun to talk. This is my first kind of cross-cultural podcast, um, so it's fun to kind of talk about some of those elements of the book that with a host that understands it because you live there so (laughs) you you live it out yourself so thank you for having me on yeah well thank you so much Leslie and uh yeah so for anyone that wants to pick up invited you know where to find it and follow Leslie on social media she has a lot of wonderful topics that she discusses for everywhere from parenting to matters of faith and conflicts of faith, evolving faith, cross-cultural issues, being white in a multicultural world, learning about white privilege. I mean, she's, she covers so many different topics. So go ahead and check out scrapingraisins.com and I'll put it in the show notes too. And yeah, thanks again for listening. If you enjoyed this, go ahead and write us on social media. If you really enjoyed it, you could always write a review to help other people to find our podcast. Thanks so much.